Hi again, and welcome this time to lesson five for GCSE Computer Science. This particular lesson is going to look at different types of storage devices that we use with computer systems. So, as usual, let's go and have a look at what the specification says that we actually need to know. So in terms of storage devices, there's a range of things that the specification says that we have to have an understanding of. The first thing is we need to understand why we need secondary storage, what it's there for. We need to have a basic idea of the different data capacities of the different secondary storage devices and how we might go about calculating how much storage we might need for a given set of files. We'll need to look at the different types of storage devices that we have, and in particular, we need to be able to differentiate between optical storage, magnetic, and solid state storage. And then identify characteristics, features of these types of storage that we would use when making a decision as to what type of storage device we would use in a given scenario. So, Let's just recap again a concept from one of our previous lessons. So, we should be happy now with this idea that we have a CPU, a central processing unit. This kind of acts as the brain of our computer system. It's the CPU's job to fetch those instructions from memory, decode them and execute it. And it does that using the control unit, which is responsible for fetching the instructions, the ALU, which is responsible for carrying out any arithmetic, maths, or logic functions, and cache, which is a storage area inside the CPU, really fast, but can only hold a very small amount of data. We've then got our primary storage, our main memory, our RAM, and our secondary storage, of which our hard drive is an example. And in terms of speed of access, accessing anything inside the CPU is really fast. RAM is next, and then hard drive secondary storage is slower. But the key difference here is as we go from faster storage to slower storage, the capacity, the amount of data that that storage medium can hold, increases substantially. So cache inside the CPU can hold a few megabytes. Main memory, RAM, a few gigabytes. And secondary storage, in particular a hard drive, hundreds of gigabytes. So, let's look at our capacities because it's really important that we know how much data each of these different capacities can store and that we can rank them in order. In this example, from smallest to largest. So a bit is the smallest piece of information held within a computer. And a bit will either be a zero or a one. A nibble is made up of four bits. It's half a byte. A byte, 8 bits. It's enough to store a single character, a single letter. A kilobyte, a thousand bytes. In the same way that a kilogram is a thousand grams. So a kilobyte, a thousand bytes. Megabyte, a thousand kilobytes. Gigabyte, a thousand megabytes. Spot the pattern here. And a terabyte, a thousand gigabytes. They just increase by a thousand each time. Bit being the smallest, terabyte being the largest in this example here. Although there are capacities larger than a terabyte. So, when calculating capacities, and you may be asked to do this in the exam, and you've got to bear in mind that in the exam, you're not allowed to use a calculator on any of the two papers that you do. Calculators are not allowed. So it's really important that if you're not that great at doing the arithmetic, the maths, that you at least show you're working out. That way you'll pick up some marks even if you get the actual answer wrong. 
So if we need to work out how many bytes there are in a megabyte, all we need to do is work out how many kilobytes there are in a megabyte, there are a thousand, how many bytes there are in a kilobyte, and then multiply them out. Now again, if you can't get the maths correct here, but you can show the working out, in the exam you should still pick up some marks. So, let's take a more complicated example. You're going to save 10 images, and each image is 72 bytes in size. How many kilobytes is this? In other words, how many kilobytes would you need to save 10 images that are 72 bytes in size each? If you show you're working out, it's relatively simple. We've got 10 images, it's 72 bytes each. So we've got 10 times 72. In the exam, we've probably already picked up a mark here. That gives us 720 bytes. Check though, how it wants us to express the answer. It wants us to express the answer in kilobytes. There are a thousand bytes in a kilobyte. So to get 720 bytes into kilobytes, we've got 0 0.72 kilobytes. Always pay attention to the unit that they want you to give the answer in. But even if you struggle with that bit, you'd probably pick up marks for having this first bit here. So always give those questions a go. So, let's have a look at the different categories of storage that we can have in a computer system. So we've got magnetic storage. The most common type of magnetic storage that you guys will be familiar with will be the one that's hidden inside your laptop or inside your desktop computer and that's the hard drive, this thing here. Or without its case, it looks something like this. And that will be installed inside your computer. And it's to the magnetic hard drive that you'll save most of your data. When you go to File and Save, you're normally saving to a hard drive, one of these. We've then got optical storage. Optical storage includes things like CD-ROMs, DVDs, and Blu-ray discs. And they're called optical storage because they're read using lasers. Lasers are shot and reflect off the surface of the disc, depending upon whether there's a zero or a one. And then the final category of storage that we've got is solid state. Those are the ones that save data inside of chips, that have no moving parts, your memory pens, your memory cards, your solid state hard drives that are becoming increasingly more popular. And remember, we need these devices, we need secondary storage because RAM is volatile and we only have a small amount of ROM. So we need somewhere to save our data to even when the computer is switched off. And that's the secondary storage. So, let's take a look at our magnetic storage. Typical example of magnetic storage is your hard drive. It has moving parts. It's got a disc here that spins round. On a typical hard drive, that disc will spin round at around about 7,000 times a minute, exceedingly fast. There's a read-write head here that quickly moves across the disc surface, reading or writing the data. That's often the clicking sound that you can hear if you put your ear really close to your computer as you're saving or opening programs. Data is written magnetically to the drive. A magnet has a north and a south pole. We need to be able to store binary data, zeros and ones. So we've got a way of representing zeros and ones, north or south magnetic charge. Typically a hard drive will hold a lot of data it tends to be the largest capacity device that we use. 500 gigabytes, typically one terabyte is common these days. Even two, three terabytes of data is not unheard of. They're generally reliable, although because they've got moving parts, they are susceptible to sudden movements. 
if you were to drop a device with a hard drive in, the chances are the data would be damaged. They're relatively fast to access, not as fast as solid state storage, but accessing data on a magnetic hard drive is still faster than accessing data on a CD or a DVD. And one of the main advantages is that they're relatively cheap per gigabyte. A one terabyte magnetic hard drive these days will cost you in the region of £40. That's cheap per gigabyte. And most desktop computers will use a magnetic hard drive. The cheaper laptops will also use magnetic hard drives. Lots of laptops these days, though, are going towards solid state. And we'll explain why a little later on. So that's magnetic storage. Typically, we're talking about magnetic hard drives. Optical storage. These are devices that are read using lasers. We use a laser to burn a small hole into the disk surface. That's how we can differentiate between a zero and a one. The laser registers a hole in the disk surface, or it doesn't register a hole in the disk surface. Again, it has moving parts. The disk spins round in the device. A mechanism with the laser moves up and down underneath the disk to read it. Some devices can't be written to. We can't write data to them. Those are the ones that end with ROM, CD-ROM. We can read data on it. We can't write data to it or change data. Anything that has an R after it means it's recordable, means that we can write data to it. So if you were going to burn a CD with music tracks, you'd go and buy a CD-R. If you were going to produce a DVD and put a film on that DVD, you'd go and buy a DVD-R because you can record to that device. And they're exceedingly cheap, about 20 to 50p each. However, they can't hold a lot of data. A CD can hold around about 650 megabytes of data. A DVD around about four gigabytes of data. So they're cheap to buy, matter of pence, but they can't hold a substantial amount of data. A CD will hold approximately 70 minutes of audio. A DVD will hold approximately two hours of video. One slight problem of optical storage devices uh, is that they're not in a case they can be easily scratched. And if you scratch the surface of the disk, you may no longer be able to read the data on them. And if the data is important, you may very well have lost it. And then finally, our solid state storage. And these include things like flash memory, which we talked about in the previous lesson, and solid state drives, which are in effect the same thing. They use the same technology in effect. They're synonyms, if you like. Two words that mean the same thing. They have no moving parts. That's why they're called solid state. Nothing actually moves within the device. And it stores the data inside of chips, those small wafer-like components that are millimeters tall. And therefore, because they have no moving parts, they're more robust. You drop a solid state storage device and it's still likely to function. It's still likely to have the data on there. Whereas if you were to drop a normal magnetic hard drive, chances are you would have lost the data on there. Because they're wafer thin, those chips, they take up less physical space. So you'll find solid state storage in things like smartphones, mobile phones, tablets. It's what means that you can create those devices that are really thin and sleek. Imagine putting a hard drive like this inside a mobile phone. The mobile phone is not going to be very portable and it's not going to be very robust. You know, your screen is going to break 
but at least with a solid state drive, your data will be intact. That wouldn't be the case if your data was stored on your magnetic hard drive. Because they've got no moving parts, the battery life will be longer because you don't need to keep a disk spinning around. Again, makes it suitable for portable devices that run off batteries, like phones, like tablets. And they're very quick to access. Again, back to this fact they have no moving parts. You can access the data exceedingly fast. That's one reason why a mobile phone will start up much more quickly than your desktop computer. A laptop computer or a desktop computer that uses a solid state hard drive will boot up much more quickly than one that uses a magnetic hard drive. Your programs will load much more quickly. But a disadvantage of solid state storage is that all this speed comes at a price. Just like a Ferrari, it's fast but it's expensive. Solid state memory is fast but it's expensive compared to a magnetic hard drive. And something that a lot of people are not always aware of is that solid state storage, you can only read and write data so many times. You can only modify the data on solid state storage a limited number of times. In most cases, people are gonna get rid of the device before you reach that limit. But this may be an important factor for businesses or indeed schools that have computers that are eight, nine, ten, or so years old. So, when we're choosing the media that we need to use, there are a range of things that we need to consider in terms of criteria for choosing media. Capacity, how much data it will store. Speed, how fast can we access that data. Durability, can we move the device around? Will the device get scratched? What will happen if I drop the device? Reliability. Once I've written the data to the device, will I be able to read the data back off it accurately enough? Will it have corrupted my data so I can't read it back? Cost. Not only how much does the device cost to buy, a memory pen might be cheap at four pounds but it might only be able to hold four gigabytes of data. A hard drive might be expensive at 40 pound, but it might be able to hold one terabyte of data. So it's important that we consider the cost per gigabyte, not just the cost of buying the individual device. And then the portability. If I'm buying a device so that I can transfer a file between home and school, I need something that I can fit in my pocket. Standard hard drive, not gonna be suitable for that. Portable hard drive, yes. Memory pen, yes. So we also need to consider portability. So, just looking at the last couple of slides, we've ordered devices in terms of capacity, from typical capacity from smallest to largest. So CD-ROM, smallest capacity, DVD, next. Memory pen, tends to be in the middle. Solid state hard drive, then magnetic hard drive. In terms of speed, solid state drive, fastest, together with memory pen. Then the hard drive, then the DVD, and then the CD-ROM. So fastest to slowest. Cost per gigabyte, most expensive, your solid state storage. Then your hard drive, then your DVD and CD-ROM. Durability, how reliable it is. Most durable, solid state storage. Hard drive in the middle. Least durable, your optical storage devices, because they're easily scratched. So, let's look at an example of deciding what storage device we're going to use. So we've got a school. We want to issue a short 30 minute promotional video to all future students. Suggest a suitable storage medium and justify 
your choice. So typically, 30 minute video issuing to all the students in a school. So we're talking about 100, maybe more, that we need to hand out to people. So if we think about this, we need something that's going to be cheap. We don't want something that's expensive. It needs to hold 30 minutes of video. I'm thinking video is going to be a DVD. DVDs are a matter of pence, so because I need over 100 of them, it's going to be relatively cheap. Much cheaper than giving everybody a memory pen, for instance. So, DVD, optical storage, cheap, we're talking 50p or so each. We need to hand out about 100 of them. Capacity 4 gigabyte, that's going to be enough for a 30 minute video. And portable, small enough to give to parents or children to take home. So, let's recap the key terms. Optical storage, reads and writes data using lasers, has moving parts, cheap to buy but low capacity. In fact, most computers these days and laptops no longer come with an optical drive. Magnetic storage, reads and writes data magnetically, those north and south poles represented the zeros and ones, has moving parts, relatively fast to access, stores lots of data, and typically cheap per gigabyte. Solid state, stores data inside of chips, has no moving parts and therefore is robust, suitable for portable devices, fast to access, but expensive per gigabyte. So, end with our usual bit of trivia. Back in 2001, Apple launched their first iPod. This idea that you could carry around in your pocket a thousand songs using a five gigabyte magnetic hard drive. Apple eventually moved away from magnetic hard drives to solid state. Advantage being you could make the devices smaller and thinner. Disadvantage being that the most recent iPods actually using solid state memory can't store as many songs as the last iPod that was released with a magnetic hard drive. So there's a trade-off between the thickness of the device and the amount of data we can store. In the 1980s, many computers were loaded off of tapes, and it was on a cassette tape that you had your game. And it would take well over 10 minutes to load the game off of that tape. Thanks for listening. I'll see you again with the next lesson.